Hi, everybody. Welcome to our fourth uh, lecture in our alumni series that we started at the height of the pandemic and which we considered to be such a success that we wanted it to continue for all our alumni and friends all over the states, all over the world. Um, just a few updates about the program. We do have uh, some students with us today uh, who are in the audience to watch this lecture. So we're represented, we're represented by many diff uh, different generations of FSU Florence Knowles, I myself being one of them, class of 94. And I'm so happy to see here uh, so many of our mud angels have joined us. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much. Uh, we can't wait to have a chance to get back to the study center and uh, come visit us and engage with our current groups of students. And I see some of my former students that took my art history class back in the day. And so I'm so happy that you guys uh, could join us. This spring has been a successful semester as we're sort of winding down here in Italy and Florence with the pandemic. And uh, we instituted a whole bunch of new stuff. Having a new study center is almost getting to know a new person, see how they react to certain things, see how the new building responds to the needs of our students and faculty and staff. So the building is constantly and organically uh, changing and growing and we'll be so happy to show it off to all of you once, once you have uh, a moment to get back to Florence and be with us. Um, I'm going to, after this brief little uh, welcome, just wanted to give you one of the secondary reasons why we like to do these alumni lectures, not just to keep you engaged, but especially with the pandemic uh, and with some of the other things that are going on worldwide. Um, even though we are redoubling our efforts here at the FSU Florence program to give back to our community with fundraising and with donations and our students volunteering so generously their time with these charitable organizations and doing pro bono campaigns with people who need help uh, in the city. Some of our students back home also need that same sort of help. If we could give everybody the same opportunity that we had who wants to come to study abroad, whether it's in Florence, Valencia, London, or Panama City, that they too have the same opportunity that we did. So very briefly, I'd like to bring back Zoe from Tallahassee who would just give you a couple 30 seconds or so of how we do that for all of our students. Wonderful, thank you, Frank. I'm just gonna share a slide very quickly here. Um, I just wanna share a few ways that you can stay involved with international programs and really support international programs. So we have community engagement volunteer opportunities. And if you're interested in that, please um, send us an email at ip-alumni at fsu.edu. Um, and then to give the gift of international education by making a donation, you can contact Sharishni Patel at spatel at foundation.fsu.edu. Um, and of course, we're always looking for memories and photos. So if you want to share a little bit of your study abroad story, please let us know. And you can do that by emailing ip dash media at fsu.edu. So there's a few different ways you can stay involved and we really appreciate each and every one of you for being here today. Um, again, my name is Zoe and if you want to get in contact with me, you can email um, IP alumni and we will, um, I'll get back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Zoe. And the response from our community has been quite wonderful. Um, not only have we got in alumni donations to uh, offer students the spaces and the technologies that they need here in Florence, but some of our Florence alumni have gotten really creative. For instance, two of our alumni met in, on a summer program and they're getting married in Florence. 
and I'll be sort of the fake pastor who will be marrying them. And instead of, instead of wedding gifts, uh, the, the guests to that wedding, which will take place here in Florence in the fall, uh, donations will go towards uh, helping our students get a scholarship to come study abroad in Florence. So here's the man of the hour that we've all been waiting on. Uh, he's been with us uh, since 2007, right? Since 2007, Dr. Voss. Uh, we were in the trenches together, both as faculty members in those years. And he teaches uh, the uh, philosophy of political theory with us here at FSU Florence. He teaches uh, engagement in 21st century politics with us here in Florence. And uh, one of his most popular classes is his cultural anthropology class. So I'd like to introduce to you everybody, Dr. Emiliano Vaz. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Let me switch the phone off of the very embarrassed if it went on. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone from, uh, for being here. Thank you everyone home. It's, uh, I'm looking at you through the screen. It's, uh, it's a true honor, a true pleasure. Um, this idea of the lectures was uh, something I very happily participated in when we first thought of it. Uh, it's after all what we do best. Um, it's teaching and spreading knowledge. So without further ado, let me start uh, with my lecture about Tuscan food. Just a little disclaimer, first of all, um, if you're going to look for recipes, well, you'll get one, just one. Uh, and probably by the end of tonight, you'll be famished. And I apologize for this. Okay, uh, let me first share the screen. All right. Good, we're good to go. So let's start from the title, Bada come la fuma, which is uh, a slogan of a place, a sandwich shop, literally two doors uh, away from our study center. Uh, it's probably the most famous place in town. This is, of course, just an excuse to introduce my lecture. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you three stories, three stories that have to do with food, identity, with concepts of authenticity uh, and ambiguity. Um, and by the end of these three stories, I'll uh, take a moment and do some final considerations. So let's start right away with Alantico Vinayo, which is the name of the sandwich place, which is just outside. Uh, here is the face uh, of the, well, the founder, let's put it that way, um, of this place, Tommaso Mazzanti. Bada come la fuma literally means, or can be translated as, take a look at how steamy it is, because when he cuts the bread, the bread, the schiacciata, this particular kind of uh, soft, salted bread, it's it just came out of the oven, so it's literally steamy and, and, and smoking. Um, the place was opened in 1989, uh, and, um, a couple of decades later, three decades later, in fact, there are now nine different locations, seven of which are here in Italy, a couple around Florence, Milan, Rome, two in the USA, one in New York, one in uh, Los Angeles. Alantico Vinaio um, is a famous spot because already in 2014, it was the most reviewed restaurant on TripAdvisor. And that, of course, contributes a lot to the success of a place because people read about it and they want to try it out. Uh, so successful that if you are to measure 
in financial terms, um, you get a declared yearly revenue between 3 million and 6 million euros. Now, how many sandwiches do you have to make to get that amount of money? Um, so let's get into the, uh, the impact that this place has had on this town, on this culture, on Florentine culture, and on the food culture of Florence. You can see on the left, Left hand side, the way that Via de Neri, the, the very road where our study center is located, looked in the mid 80s, just a few years before the place opened up. And the picture on the right instead is a picture that could have been taken any day these days um, in the mornings. Uh, people here in the room know exactly too well what the look, what the, the street looks like um, during the mornings, especially around lunchtime when it's literally packed by people from all over the world trying to, queuing to, to get a schiacciata, to get a sandwich, to get a panino. Uh, that's, I think, a very graphic image of the success of this enterprise. And if you uh, 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 talk to Tommaso Mazzanti, there are interviews, of course, the man is a, is a media star. Um, he will always insist about how Tuscan that place is, how pure their ingredients are. Now I have to say the ingredients are uh, objectively very good. The sandwiches they make are objectively very good. It's not really something you can get anywhere else in the city. And this is a very common comment around town. We used to have in, uh, uh, remember Frank, a shop just next to the old study center, which did exactly the same. And those sandwiches were very, very good. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, in Borgo Albizzi. So what are the reasons of his success? Before we get into that, let me uh, uh, introduce you the man himself. This is a short video um, taken in Los Angeles the day of its opening, uh, just 30 minutes before uh, the place was open. Just take a look. It's an Italian, but you know, just a promotional video. Just take a look at the queue. The audio was fine, Zoe. Could you hear the sound from her? Yes, we could hear it. All right, good, because we have a second video later on, and I was just wondering if we had to make some changes. <clears throat> so, what are the reasons of uh, the success of Alantico Vinayo? Um, the screenshot uh, on the left was taken a few days ago. Um, it now counts more than 30,000 um, reviews on TripAdvisor. You can see on the right, is, that's a TikTok a screenshot. Uh, Tommaso Mazzanti is on every possible social network and social media 
Uh, and he's a funny character. There's no denying that he knows exactly how to play into the logic of those medias. Uh, but that's exactly the point. Um, his success is a mixture of opportunity, of creativity, because he's a, definitely a very creative man, likability, um, a little, of course, business uh, instincts. He has been clever in, his, in the timing of um, his, his openings. That is to say, uh, all these elements I just mentioned, these are the recipe, the perfect recipe of any restaurant, of any enterprise, in fact, in any place of the world. These are the, the skills you need, the factors that can determine the success of a restaurant, of any enterprise, in, in fact, in any industry around the world. And here is my claim, there's nothing inherently Tuscan about this. One could make the joke, of course, that the only Tuscan thing probably are the business instincts. After all, we live in a city that has had great merchants uh, in, in the past, but not the ingredients, not the kind of food. It's dubbed, it's labeled as street food, but street food by definition is food that is prepared in, a, in the street, that is in a mobile form, usually in a truck. Uh, and this is definitely not the case with Alantico Vinayo. It's eaten in the street, which is a different thing, uh, causing, in fact, even a, a few problems. So what happens here is that there has been a sort of, uh, it, this place has become a sort of fetish uh, of Italian food, but the fetish in this case is completely detached by the very object that it would like to symbolize. And this is happening uh, a little bit all over the country. Now, uh, of course, this story raises the question and each story that I will tell tonight will raise a question. What do we really mean when we say Tuscan food? And I'll try to answer those questions by the end of our presentation. The second story concerns another very famous character, Dario Cecchini, a butcher. Here you can see, uh, again, another screenshot taken from Netflix. Uh, there's this uh, original documentary series um, called Chef's Table, and one episode is uh, devoted to Dario Cecchini. Dario Ch this is from a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Dario Cecchini was already uh, famous 15, 20 years ago. Um, here there is uh, a video, it's a bit blurred, it's a bit old, um, not the greatest quality, but this is the meeting between Dario Cecchini and the sorely missed Anthony Bourdain, the, the chef writer that uh, is unfortunately no longer with us. So um, let's see if this works. Don't think it will. Zoe, can you give me a head up if, you can see the video. Do I, need uh, to I can't see the video at the moment. I'm still seeing Something. your PowerPoint. Sorry, say it again. I'm still seeing your PowerPoint. Okay, because I need then you to share. You might have to reshare the, the yeah. other one. And when yes. you do it, if you click share sound, that will make sure that we can hear it well. Yes. I'm sharing it again. There you go. You should be able to see a YouTube video now. Yes, we can see the video. All right, good. And someone truly extraordinary. This is Antica Macelleria Cecchini. It's a butcher shop, but not really. In the words of Bill Buford, writing about it in his best selling book, Heat, it's a museum of Tuscan cooking. And this man, Dario Cecchini, is the most famous and most respected butcher in Italy, and maybe the world. Po diavolo, un po' furto, per prendere aria e cervello, vengono migliori idee. But just as a macelleria is not simply a butcher shop, Dario is not just a butcher. He's something else entirely. He's a repository of knowledge for all things Tuscan, 
be it foodways, historical arcania, literature, or poetry. He's a fierce defender of traditional methods of preparation and original Medici era recipes. And he's something of an expert on that most famous of Tuscans, Dante Alighieri. Questi, che mai da me mi fia diviso, la bocca mi bacio, tutto tremante. Cesare and I showed up on a Sunday with the intention of shopping. A good day to shop. I, I gotta tell you though, I'm a little afraid of this guy, to meet this guy. Uh, you know guy? what is the, the trick with him? So when he talk, he talk with a big voice. Right. You need to do bigger. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ciao Dario! Come stai? Cesare! Che bella cosa è tu sei lì. Ciao Tony. You see how many people? Okay. Because they're doing all the... By hand. By hands, what is important. But only Tuscan. Right? Only Tuscan. Yes. Only, only Tuscan traditions and only oh. the, the, the old way. Yes. Che ci consigli? Qualcosa di diverso di, di quello che mangiamo oggi a, a pranzo? A pranzo, qualcosa di diverso. Potete prendere degli... Che io chiamo per gioco il sushi dei pianti. Tartare. Due crostini, un po' di burro dei chianti per fare due crostini. La finocchiona per cominciare a bere un buon bicchiere di vino. Sono le fette di maiale e la coppa fresca di maiale con il fiore di finocchio selvatico. La cosa più toscana che si può. La mia famiglia fa questo lavoro da 250 anni. Ogni figlio ha fatto il lavoro del padre. La guerra ha distrutto la macelleria, è stata ricostruita, fatta come era una volta per continuare la tradizione del lavoro. È una grande gioia di continuare dopo secoli la tradizione di questo cibo toscano. I'm gonna pass out from happiness. <laughs> Tell him I want to curl up inside the counter and go to sleep at dinner. Io vuole vuol dormire qui stasera. Perfetto. È possibile. È un po' scomodo per entrare. Allora ragazzi, si do. Inside and outside the macelleria, it's controlled chaos. <laughs> Employees pour wine to one and all. Great mounds of lardo are smeared on crostinis. Polpettas and salumis offered and accepted. More wine. The party spills out of the jam shop and onto and up and down the street. A porchetta appears, an operatic performance, a blur of pork, music, large knives, red wine, and poetry. Ciccia! Come bella la ciccia! E quanta buona! Cesare and I managed to get out alive with our supplies, and Dario has promised to show up at the villa later for dinner. Okay, so let me share again my presentation. So uh, as you can see, the man has been a media star already for quite some time. This is what um, Bill Buford, uh, says about him in his very um, famous book, Heat, the one that, the very book that uh, Anthony Bourdain mentioned in the video. Dario was the most highly regarded butcher in Italy. His shop wasn't simply a butcher shop, but a museum of Tuscan cooking. Raw and cooked meat, cuts of Chianti beef, along with ragouts and sauces and cured porks, a university of the zona. The shop, was like a foreign country inside Panzano. Panzano is the little town south of Florence where the butcher shop is located, with its own laws and head of state, not unlike the Vatican, if the Vatican were a giant butcher shop. So that sort of uh, gives you the size of um, the character. Now, it became so famous that, of course, media um, uh, kept uh, writing stories about Dario Cecchini. Here is one from the New York Times from 2012. And there was this one 
um, quote that really struck me. There are requests to open restaurants in Paris, New York, Berkeley, California. Instead, Mr. Cecchini chooses to remain monarch of his tiny empire of meat in Panzano, a burger joint, a steakhouse, a restaurant serving the forgotten cuts of the cow, and supporting it all, the family butchery, where he is on most days between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. The monarch of a tiny empire, and of an empire which is usually symbolized by a very specific animal. You know that most uh, uh, monarchies and empires in the past used to have their own um, symbols. The symbol of this empire is this, the Chianina. The Chianina is a breed um, of large white cattle. It was used in the past for labor, for drought, um, uh, because it's, uh, in fact, it's not a very fat animal, it's a very tall animal. Uh, but now it's mostly used because the famous Bisteca la Fiorentina, the Florentine steak, comes from it. And again, let's go back to, uh, well, no, before we go back to, to Bill Buffer, let's just to give you an idea of how important Canina is. So just some of the um, um, logos of restaurants that are inspired uh, by the Canina. The one in the center is the menu a very exclusive restaurant in Florence. As you can see in the top right-hand corner, there is a full section of the menu only devoted to that particular kind of, of meat. But as I was saying, uh, let's go back, back to Bill Buford. For Italians, no image is more evocative of Chianti than a Chianina. The word Chianti seems buried inside it. Every cliche about the region is in this animal. All that rugged stone house, beef eating, peasant authenticity, unfortunately, you don't see them anymore. Just a bit of a revelation if you think about the fame and the symbolism that the Canina has, as I tried to present you just earlier. Uh, what does he mean when he says that you don't see them anymore? Well, I checked the official data. Here you can see the number of Tuscan breeds between 2010 and 2016, there are no more recent data. I've, I've searched everywhere. There's the official data from the local association of uh, uh, farmers. Um, the Kenina has a number of specimens just short of um, 4,000. Uh, that means about 4.5% of the entire number of cattle in the region. It's not a big number. In fact, a very small number, probably a number that cannot feel the demand that comes from restaurants uh, and you know, burger joints. So what's the real story here? Again, Bill Boofer. Ever since I had made the discovery, I wondered how it conveys magnitude. Actually, I don't know what to do except offer up the bare fact. The meat sold by Dario Cecchini most famous butcher in Italy, possibly the most famous living Tuscan, is Spanish. Darius beef came from a Spanish cow, raised a thousand miles away on a small farm on the Costa Brava and delivered in a truck that left Spain every Thursday and arrived in Panzano on Friday, long before anyone else in the village was up. For a while, I wondered if this was why the deliveries came before dawn, so no one would see the Spanish plates on the vehicle. Now, to be honest, even in the past, Dario Cecchini has never really claimed uh, to sell Chianina, while in fact he was not doing that. He just simply kept silent about the origin of its meat because people would normally assume that if you go and buy meat in his butcher shop in Panzano, Chianina is what you get, but this was not exactly the case. So he was asked about this and this is uh, what he answered. The Chianina is now, and uh, the way Bill Buffer writes this is quite funny because he tries to reproduce in the written form the broken English of Dario Cecchini. I won't do that, no, I'm not being Tuscan, I don't know if I can reproduce that. 
The Kianina is now not good because it is fundamentally banal. It is a name. Prada is a name. Versace is a name. Armani is a name. Kianina is a name. If I sold it, which I do not, I would be selling a name. Would I make money selling a name? Certainly. Would it be good for business? Certainly. But business does not interest me. Names do not interest me. Meat interests me. That's why I sell meat, not names. Besides, Dario adds in a final flourish, I don't believe in the purity of races. You evidently believe in the purity of races. So did Hitler. But Hitler, in my view, was wrong. Now, it was, uh, 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 he still is, fortunately, uh, very, it's a way, in a way, he's an intellectual, he's a great character, he's a true master of his art. Um, but he had to accept the fact that, uh, and work around it, work a justification around the fact that uh, the meat he was selling was Spanish. That, that, of course, begs the question. That peasant authenticity that Bill Buford was referring to, what happened to it? What is, in fact, authenticity? And again, this is one of the questions that I'll be answering just after our next story, which is probably, at least to me, the, more, the most interesting one. And this is the story of the Dolce Forte. The Dolce Forte is a dish which is very hard to, uh, to find, um, even today, in, in the restaurants of Florence. It's an old recipe uh, that very few restaurants do, and, very, and uh, even fewer restaurants do properly. Dolce Forte means, it's a translation, means uh, sweet and sour. Now, you need to know, we have to go back all the way to the Roman times, because uh, uh, this is the legacy uh, that we received from the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, a lot of the characteristics of the cooking through the Middle Ages, through Renaissance, all the way to the 16th, 17th, even 18th century, um, were simply, again, legacy of the Roman way of cooking food. Among these, the combination of sweet and sour. Back in the day, of course, sweet would be honey and sour would be vinegar. And those were the two strongest element that would be combined uh, in different dishes. But also the practice of mixing different flavors and the use of spices that the Romans would import and ship in from all over the Mediterranean. Uh, this tradition lasted all the way to the end of the 19th century when the most famous book about Italian cooking was published, Pellegrino Artusi, La Scienza in Cucina e l'Arte di Mangiare Bene, Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well. As you can see there, you, there you have the actual recipe uh, published in 1891 of Cignale Dolce Forte, even uses the old fashioned spelling, Cignale. And let me point out that one of the ingredients of um, the recipe is chocolate. Now you go and ask uh, some of the chefs here, they will probably tell you that this was always uh, done this way, but of course that cannot be. This is the way, more or less, that cinghiale in dolce forte looks like today, with this brown sauce uh, around it. And the brown is the color, of course, of, of, of chocolate. Um, the people that claim that the recipe dates all the way back to the Middle Ages are, of course, wrong, in the sense that there was simply no chocolate in Europe before 1492. That's a very easy observation. It is more, it is easier to believe that the mixture of sweet and sour tastes came all the way from the Roman Empire through the centuries. So probably something like Cinghiale Dolce Forte did exist um, in the centuries before the first contact of the Europeans with the American continent. What this means is this, that somebody 
After 1492, uh, probably a woman decided to melt a piece of chocolate in a sauce that was being prepared for a wild boar stew. And of course, we have not really any documentary evidence of that. But when you, if you've traveled a lot, uh, or a little bit, in fact, it's, uh, this, this particular dish looks uh, particularly like one that I like very much. This one, this is the Mexican national dish, pollo con mole poblano. You might have heard of it. It's usually referred to as chicken mole. Uh, they look very much the same. They even taste uh, quite similarly. Mole is slightly spicier. Uh, and instead of wild boar, you get chicken. So there is a parallel going on here. And in order to understand that, I need you just to open up a quick window on the short history of chocolate. Uh, Europeans were already aware uh, that the Aztecs in central Mexico used chocolate as early as the conquest of Mexico itself, 1519, 1524. The first document, the first documentary evidence that mentions cocoa and chocolate was written in 1529, and is now kept, guess where? Right here in Florence. It's a true gem that I was lucky enough to, to see, not to touch. The Codex Florentinus, which is the archival name, of course, of a text uh, not exactly written, but coordinated by a Franciscan monk, Bernardino de Saugun, uh, whose title is General History of the Things of New Spain. New Spain was the name of Mexico before Mexico um, gained its independence. In the 10th book, People, their, vir their Virtues and Vices in Other Nations, you can actually see right there um, an Aztec woman pouring down hot chocolate from one drinking vessel to another. This was a technique used in order to generate foam on top of the chocolate. And, and so this was documented early on in the very first stages of the conquest of, of Mexico. Maybe if we are likely, we could go and uh, visit the Biblioteca Laurenciana and take a look at the original codex. So what happens here is this. We knew about the chocolate, the Europeans knew about the chocolate early on, but there's a 70 years time lag between the first encounter with chocolate and its wide scale use here. Uh, it's about the first decades of the 17th century that chocolate and all the paraphernalia, the drinking vessels, the cups themselves, because they were especially made, used in its consumption in the Spanish American colonies were included in the transatlantic shipments of, of goods. And we know this because we have the registers from those ships. Now, there's also another testimony, a very early testimony, that explains how did chocolate get to Tuscany? Because remember, we're trying to understand how did it happen that all of a sudden uh, a wild boar stew got chocolate inside? We have a testimony from 16, um, in fact, so from the first decade of the 17th century by Francesco Carletti. What a great character. Francesco Carletti was the first man that traveled around the world, not as an explorer. He was a merchant. That means that he did not own his own ships, but he would go on other ships and from port to port around the planet, around the globe, trying to uh, by trying to do his job, being a merchant, buy and sell all sorts of goods. When he comes back 15 years after his departure, he departed in uh, um, 1591, um, he went straight to the court of the Medici here in Florence, the Grand Duke back then was Ferdinand I, to tell uh, him about his adventures, his uh, financial opportunities and discoveries. And um, uh, Ferdinando died a few years later, and that's when Francesco Carletti felt the need to write his memoir. This is the 
this is a, a picture of the actual um, edition from 1701. And in fact, on the right hand side, you can um, pretty much 10th line, you can actually see that he starts speaking about the cocoa tree, the cocoa seeds. Fortunately, we do have um, an English translation. I'd like to take a moment and read a few lines from this. Um, this is the place where cacao grows, a famous fruit of great importance in that province, which is said to consume more than 50,000 scudos worth of it each year. That fruit also is used as money, blah, 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 but its principal use is in a certain drink, which the Indians call chocolate. This is, in, in the original version, he calls it chocolate sort of resembles today's drinks. This is made by mixing the fruit, which is as large as an acorn, with hot water and sugar. First, the fruits are dried very well and roasted over a fire. Then they're placed on certain stones and are treated in the way we make colors for painters, being ground with a pestle, which also is of stone, lengthwise on a flat, smooth stone. And thus it comes to be formed into a past that is dissolved in water and served as a beverage. It is drunk commonly by everyone, both the natives of the country and the Spaniards, and by those of every other nation who go there. Now, what is Carletti, uh, Francesco Carletti really telling us here? Two things. First of all, that by the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, chocolate was a widespread beverage across the Americas. And two, that cocoa was already known and possibly used by the elites at the Medici court in Florence. The first concrete documentary evidence of the use of chocolate in Tuscany dates to a few decades later under the court of that very ugly man, Cosimo the the third, uh, who had his own secret recipe for hot chocolate. It was only published after his death in the early 18th century. Uh, it was made with uh, uh, jasmine. Um, so there was a, this different mixing of spices with jasmine flowers, sugar, vanilla, and finally enough, amber gris or gray amber, which you need to know is, uh, and I, I honestly did not know before uh, doing my research, the foreign smelling intestinal byproduct of the sperm whale. So it was very hard to come around, to come about. Uh, and, and it was included in this uh, beverage that Cosimo was so uh, fond of. We know this from another chronicle uh, of that time from Tommaso Rinuccini's in that chronicle, he states something very clearly, he says, the new fashion of drinking chocolate started in 1668. So there's a, a date of birth for the use of chocolate. So let's recap. What about the mole? Mole, the mole poblano uh, was something that before the conquest in uh, the, the local indigenous population were already making, it was called molli or chilmoli, which meant uh, chili sauce. Uh, something that you can easily find in Mexico today. Yet, in, in the writings of Sagun in the Codex Florentinus, there is no mention of chocolate used to flavor dishes. The legend of the mole comes later, comes in 1685. This is an actual picture of a beautiful convent in the city of Puebla, east of Mexico City the convent of Santa Rosa. Uh, and it's a legend, of course, there's no truth in it. Uh, the legend goes that um, a nun, uh, Sor Andrea de la Asuncion, was supposed to make this dinner for uh, the archbishop and the viceroy. Uh, she prayed for inspiration and then she had this idea of throwing a piece of chocolate into the spicy stew that she was making in the spicy sauce that she was making, and that is how mole uh, was born. Of course, that is just legend. But what we can do here is we can have a parallel. 
what we know is this, that chocolate becomes a fashionable and therefore accessible product in Tuscany in the second half of the 17th century. Mole Poblano's official date of birth is 1685, but more realistically, the process of adding chocolate to a sauce must have developed in an earlier decade. You can see the parallel here. The timing seems to be the same. So there is a, a parallel conjuncture taking place in the 17th century. Um, what does this mean? This means that somebody at the same time on both sides of the Atlantic decided to throw some chocolate uh, as a sweetener into sauces that had a different um, taste before. So the question here, which I'm going to answer right away, is this. What does the history of dolce forte, of this sweet sour um, sauce, tell us uh, about ourselves? It's a very interesting question, I believe. And here are my final considerations I'm going to conclude very soon. It tells us this. It tells us that alteration, innovation, changes, failures, successes, mixing up diversity in one word. All these processes that concern the evolution of food are the same processes that concern collective identities. We can draw a parallel here between the evolution in food and the evolution of us as a uh, uh, as people. Now, we are, as, as it is said often, we are what we eat. Uh, there is no way that a single label or a single recipe can encompass the complexity of a people. So, uh, it is my belief that the history of Dolce Forte uh, and of many other delicacies around the world, by the way, today is the International Taco Day that also could be taken into consideration, uh, gives us a very important suggestion. It, it suggests, it tells us that we should steer away from rigid definition, um, that we should focus on change and on the possibility of change, that we keep an open mind towards the infinite, the virtually infinite tastes of life, and that we fear not adventuring into the realm of the possible. The delicious Dolce Forte sauce that we can still uh, try today in some of Florentine restaurants was the surprising result of a very self-confident cook, possibly a woman, uh, who willingly decided to become the author of a great dish and by doing so, author of his or her own life. And this leads to the second question, what is authenticity? Because the, you can see that authenticity and author have the same origin, origin and, uh, same etymology. Now today, authenticity is a fundamental concept in the human psychology, but in its common sense, I'll be as straightforward as I can. It's a tourist trap. It's a marketing tool for people searching for cheap emotions, for a temporary membership to a unknown club, an imaginary club of savant and gourmet. You think that if you have tried something once in a restaurant, you know everything about it. It's that sense of belonging that you're actually buying, not the food. Authenticity is something different. Authenticity means etymologically to be the author of your own life, to be uh, authoritative, um, to be able to exert authority over yourself. That's the true original meaning of um, authenticity. And in this sense, the story of Dario Cecchini is quite exemplary because from the video, you saw that he, he seems so attached to this monolithic, unchangeable, old tradition, Tuscan tradition. But the truth is that he himself 
is constantly reinventing that tradition, is constantly adding or subtracting something from it or to it. Uh, and he does that in a very authoritative way. So this, this is normally historians do know that traditions most often are invented traditions. They don't come from the past. Somebody invented them for very specific purposes at a certain point in time. Finally, the one question we are all here for, uh, what is Tuscan cuisine? Now, let's start from the basic. A cuisine is defined <coughs> sorry, by at least these elements, the use of local or peculiar ingredients, the unique modes of preparations and tradition and practices of consumption. Uh, by, by this definition, you do not find a tradition. It's very unlikely to find a tradition in a restaurant. You find a tradition there where traditions are most likely to be preserved in households. That's where, as an anthropologist, I would do my fieldwork. Fortunately, somebody did it for me. In a beautiful ethnography on Florentine food, um, Carol Cunningham writes the following. The core of Tuscan cuisine rooted in mezzadria peasant farming. Mezzadria was a specific kind of uh, land tenure. It was a contract between the landowner and the family persisted at the dawn of the new millennium, but there were changes in daily meal routines, diet, cuisine, and food labor that revealed significant changes in Italian culture. In the 20th century, Florentine foodways evolved from a centuries old localized sharecropping system toward the global market economy revealing a changing cultural philosophy in beliefs and practices of consumption. Now, we are in Florence. Florence uh, cannot be representative uh, of, of the entire region of Tuscany as a whole, but it is exactly here that uh, we do see, literally outside our door, when we uh, stumble upon the queue outside Antico Vinayo, that we see at its highest intensity this cultural change that, for love of brevity, we can call globalization. Now, globalization, we know uh, that all too well is, is unstoppable, but I believe it can be and should be governed. And I would like to end up, in fact, with an example from our very program. Now, in the past, every time our students have eaten out in a chain restaurant, not only did they miss a tremendous opportunity, that's too bad, an opportunity of discovery, but we failed them as an institution. Unfortunately, that trend now is in full reverse, uh, thanks to the great work of my good friend here, Frank, our director, the staff, my fellow colleagues. We now have new courses, trips, exploration experiences, uh, and we have especially the opportunities to get in touch with the local people, with the families, with the artisans, with the chefs, with the journalists, with the people uh, uh, in every different field. Now, and food, like art, uh, like history, is in fact a terrain where cultural change happens. And it's exactly on that terrain that we should engage our students. Thank you. How do we exit? Uh, stop sharing, yes. All right. That was so well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, it was a great pleasure. Let me take a look at the faces. They seem smiling. <laughs> Personally, for me, um, 
And uh, thank you for all the complimentary words. Every day, just as the Tuscan food culture is evolving, we're evolving our curriculum and how we do things. And I appreciate very much that you acknowledge that. In fact, I wanted to give you guys, before we move on to questions, and I know we don't have that much time, but I wanted to give you a preview for our alumni lecture this summer semester that we'll be hosting the great uh, David Kirby, as well as Barbara Hamby, uh, some of the most uh, world-renowned uh, poets, contemporary poets, that as you guys know, are also FSU uh, faculty members. They'll be here in Florence and they'll be uh, gracing us with our next uh, alumni talk on June 8th. So stay, stay tuned, please, for more information regarding the next one of these lectures. Um, I'm gonna open the chat if anybody has any questions or you can simply unmute yourselves as well, if that's possible. And you could ask them live if anybody has any questions for Dr. Voss. Yes, if there's any question that I can answer to, uh, I would be very happy to. Even in the room, anyone? Boris, Boris please. Can, can you just take your mask off? Otherwise, I, thank you. And speak up. Yes, absolutely. It was um, the question concerned um, the fact that in many regions of Italy, a lot of local dishes are being somehow protected by both local and European le Union level authorities. Um, there are specific indications this, this dishes or products can only be produced in those areas according to a very rigid procedure. Um, there are two things to, to say about this. First of all, the, there's of course uh, an attempt. One of the stories that I wanted to include in tonight's lecture was about lardo di colonnata, this lard that is produced in the north of Tuscany, which is very uh, representative of, of exactly the problem you're highlighting. Um, on one hand side, you need to protect these products against the brute force of globalization. On the other side, by protecting them and fixing up on paper the procedure, what you're doing is you're crystallizing. You're, you're putting them under uh, a museum box, right? You're preventing some sort of evolution to take place. Now that evolution has still takes place, fortunately, but not anymore on those territories, but in good chefs kitchens. So the good chefs that are able to understand the value of those products and creatively use them to make new dishes outside of the so-called tradition. So you have here pros and cons of this uh, uh, authority led um, procedure for, for IGPs and DOC and the OCG and so on. Is there a question from? I, I just say everybody saying you're, saying you're awesome. Thank you. I've <laughs> seen a comment by, by Ryan uh, in the chat, if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, saying that Sodri, Sodri is the one. Uh, let me just tell you the story very quickly. Is Ryan Lang says Dario has nothing on Sodri. Uh, Sodri, Alessandro Sodri is the butcher that we invited last year in my anthro cultural anthropology course, uh, who gave a wonderful lecture. The man is, uh, is a well of knowledge and then led two of my students, Ryan is one of them and Matthew, uh, for the field work in the market of San Lorenzo. And, um, and we get to see firsthand what the work of a butcher is. And um, I think that by his comment, Ryan really appreciated it, especially the prosciutto. 
There we are. Yeah. All right. Any is there any other question in the room? I think everybody's famished by now. This one new message. Let's see. So you're telling me my panino at Vinayu is not authentic Tuscan cooking? I am. I am so sorry. I am. It was good, wasn't it? Though it was very, very good. Uh, and no, it was not Tuscan. In fact, if you watch the videos by Matsanti on both YouTube and TikTok, he sometimes uh, brags about the ingredients he uses. Those ingredients come from all over the place. There's nothing inherently Tuscan about them. He uses Caccio Cavallo from the South as a, as a cheese. He, has, he, he made this, one of his most successful videos uses this thing, which is a funny story. It's this huge, literally huge bowl of mozzarella cheese. It's called Filiata. It comes from a tiny town uh, south of Naples called Battipaglia. Um, it's, it's a huge mozzarella cheese bowl which you cut into half and uh, contains stracciatella, stracciatella is another kind of cheese, cream cheese and smaller mozzarella. So it's basically, it looks like in some twisted perverted sense, a, uh, a woman giving birth, a mozzarella giving birth to smaller mozzarella. So hence the name filiata, which means uh, uh, kids, children. Right, so it does use a lot of ingredients from all over uh, the country. Um, those make no mistake. I mean, those sandwiches are really, really good. Um, and I would never queue for more than five minutes to get one of them, in, in true honesty. And there is nothing inherently Tuscan about it. Sorry. We did have someone raising their hand on Zoom, Barbara Hollowell. Oh, yes. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting. I loved all three of the stories, and it's given me a new way to look at, um, at our at Tuscan food. One of my many takeaways was that I no longer need to stand in that long line when I visit. <laughs> but I can take a good look, maybe take a picture and move on to a less crowded place. So thank you. I'll be happy to provide addresses. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, no, you have to touch me to the... <laughs> No, no, I can't give it away. Can't give it away. Sorry. Sorry, can't give it away. All right, if there are no more questions, I thank you all. I thank you, you Frank. Uh, I thank you, everybody that um, connected to be with us. It would be lovely if you could be here. Hopefully, you can soon. And if you do, uh, let me know. We'll go get a true panino somewhere. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time, next June.